Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, with which your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? when he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people. A grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses." The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I command my spirit Father, into your hands I command my spirit Father, into your hands I command In you, O Lord, 
I take refuge. Let me not be put to shame. In your justice, save me. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, faithful God. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Into your hands I command my spirit. I am scorned by all my enemies, dreaded by friends and neighbors. When they see me, they turn away. I am like one dead and forgotten, like a vessel broken and discarded. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Into your hands I command my spirit. But Lord, I trust in you. I say, you are my God. My life is in your hands. Save me from my enemies. From the hands of those who pursue me. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. In your steadfast kindness, save me. Take courage, be strong of heart. All you who wait for the Lord, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation 
for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you, if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who, had, who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not, not one of this man's man. disciples, I, are I, you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples 
and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoke publicly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It, it was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your laws. The Jews answered him. We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own? Or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do what you want me to release to you. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? 
Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because this place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over his spirit. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened, so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. 
And again, another passage says, they will look upon him who they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We just read from the Passion Account of John. The church always selects John on Good Friday. Now his gospel begins with what's called the prologue. Here are the opening verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So before there was time or space, matter or energy, God is. And God is triune, Father, Son, and Spirit, and therefore complete and in need of nothing. A communion of persons, a perfect exchange of mutual love. Yet love is expansive and creative, so God who is love, and so the Lord in love creates everything. Our science helps us understand that, but he is the source of it all. And he created you and me and gifted us with intelligence and creativity, the capacity to love. He created us with free will. Well, you know how that turned out. Adam and Eve chose to abuse their freedom and disobey God. As a result, sin becomes part of the human, our human story and all the ravaging effects of suffering and death that follow. I watched the movie um, war, 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 <clears throat> World War Z. There we go. It's a zombie movie. You know, the infection spreads around the world. Star, stars Brad Pitt. But Bishop Barron made a commentary. He said, salvation is in the blood. So that intrigued me. So I watched the movie. Pretty good movie. Salvation is in the blood. He wasn't referring to Jesus, but he's just taking the metaphor that the movie spoke to him. And what do we have in the coronavirus? Not a zombie infection, but we have a metaphor, a powerful metaphor of what? The contagion of sin. The contagion of sin. Okay. Which can have a more devastating effect than the suffering that coronavirus can bring, because sin can bring eternal death, <clears throat> excuse me, but to salvation in the blood from the contagion of sin. And so God did not want to leave the situation as it was. And so he made a radical move to make things right to reestablish the original harmony that characterized life in the Garden of Eden, which is right relationship with God, with each other, and all creation. Now, we read about this radical move in our second reading from Hebrews. I'll quote parts of it. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, commentary, he who is divine, Not a high priest unable to sympathize with our weakness, tested in every way without sin, 
also one of us. When he was in the flesh, he learned obedience from what he suffered and became the source of eternal life for all who obey him. Yes, this word, made, this word of God was made flesh, dwelt among us. Hebrew says, the book we're reading, like, all, like us in all things but sin. You know, St. Augustine wrote about a wonderful mutual exchange between the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, and us. As God, he can't die. He's immortal. We can die. So what does he do? Mutual exchange. So we give, as it were, the power to Jesus to die. What's he give us? The power to live forever. Beautiful image of the mutual exchange. So why would he come down to this, using that geography, why would he come down? Well, of course, it's love. Profound love for us. He chose to become one of us so that he could become the new Adam, the true man whose obedience to the Father would undo the disobedience of the first Adam, the first man. He would become the suffering servant described in our first reading from Isaiah, whose suffering would atone for our sins, bring about forgiveness and reconciliation with God and each other. Now, such an outpouring of God's love, the decision not to abandon the human project, but to redo it, to, try, to not just try again, but to remake it even greater than it was originally in the garden. St. Peter says in his letter, we share in divine nature. What do you think the Lord waits for? As he pours forth his heart, his love, especially on the cross, a heartfelt response back. If you love someone dearly, it's our hope, my hope, your hope, that that person will love us back. Not in a controlling, manipulative way, but just, they'll love us back. They'll see the goodness of what we're doing, our, our love for them, our sacrificial love for them. Parents do like their kids to love them back, you know. Husband and wife do that, think it does matter if they receive a reciprocal loving uh, love back. It's just how we're made. God made us this way. So he wants a loving response back. Now that's a whole life response, isn't it? Our whole life given over to Christ. But liturgically, the church, church offers a devotional expression of our loving response with a veneration of the cross. Now, I'll offer the veneration of the cross to myself and for a few ministers that are here today. Okay? But you can have your own veneration of the cross at home with your family. Perhaps you gather in the living room, quiet down. That could be a variety. Take a moment to do that and how many people are in the house. But then find a passage, a selection from the Passion of Christ. I'm suggesting a Luke chapter 23, find the verse 23 where it talks about Peter, Jesus says as he looks out on the mob screaming at him, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do, and then to the repentant thief, today with me in paradise. It's a powerful passage, one of my favorite, so I'm prejudiced to offer it to you. And hold up the crucifix, either in your own hand or for everyone to see, and really look at it. There's no rush. <laughs> Aren't people behind you waiting, you know, like in the line of church? It's no rush, okay? Why is he on the cross? Why is he on the cross? What have you and I had to do with him being on the cross? Okay. And then accept and an act of prayer, of surrender, of, of gratitude, of whatever the spirit stirs in your heart. Accept that he chose to hang between heaven and earth because you and I are worth dying for. Our salvation is worth his horrible, torturous, barbarous death. We're worth it. And then his outstretched arms embrace you, embrace me, with a love as intense today as it was 2,000 years ago when he hung on the hill, uh, hung on the cross. Uh, on Calvary Hill. So then feel free in your home
to find the appropriate and safe devotional response, to say to the Lord how grateful you are for his dying for you, for your forgiveness of sins, to open up the gates of heaven. Also, tell him you want to be a more committed disciple of his in response to such an awesome love, a faithful love that doesn't grow old or grow cold or go away. It's always being offered to us. Then maybe you kneel before the crucifix, if it's on a wall or on a table. Hold it in your, in your forehead, touch your forehead. Embrace it with your heart. Be creative, be creative. Closing prayer. Jesus, may your victory on the cross fill us with the courage to persevere in times of difficulty, like right now, and the hope to see beyond the cross suffering we're going through, especially those who've lost their work, their jobs. See beyond the cross, as you did, Lord, to the joy of the resurrection. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God and the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever living God who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations. Watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord, pray also for our most holy father Pope Francis that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever living God, by whose decree all things are founded. Look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us that under him the Christian people governed by you their maker may grow in merit by reason of their faith through Christ our Lord. So for our Bishop Edward, that all bishops, 
priests and deacons of the church and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, Hear our humble prayer for your ministers that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of adopted children through Christ our Lord. So for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us need Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bonds of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants. Graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us 
us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, Grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be more, made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race. in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us need Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, the freedom of religion, May through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prison, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us need Stand. 
Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world. That God our Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to preserve in faith. Let us kneel. Let Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world, brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us. And in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. Through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross on which sung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world.
taken by his people.
Hmm, excuse me. Please rise, everyone. My sisters and brothers, at the Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we wait the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior in Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Please kneel. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under, under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Almighty, ever-living God, who has restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that partaking of this mystery, we may have life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ the Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Bow your heads and ask for God's blessing. May abundant blessing, O oh Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ the Lord who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. On Good Friday we depart in silence.